Thanks for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I am going to be going through a number of slides, and um, please uh, be patient with me while I do that. This is my first time using this particular webinar tool, so um, what we're going to do is uh, be spending most of our time today um, on the procurement process for purchasing goods and services with FTA dollars, ODOT's procurement checklist and forms, the documentation you need to submit to ODOT with payment requests, resources that are available to facilitate compliant procurements, and where to find what you need. Um, just to reiterate, if you do have questions, please do enter them in the chat box. There's going to be time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, um, but it would also be helpful to us if we could capture those in, in writing in case we don't get to all the questions. And we will be pulling together the question and answer list to make available to folks after the webinar. Uh, most of our time today is going to be spent in micro and small procedures, as those are the majority of procurements that uh, we all will be dealing with. Uh, also, this is really going to be, this is not going to be an all-encompassing instructional on procurements. We're really going to be focused on ODOT's Office of Transit Procurement Procedures for subrecipients. However, the next round of Transit Academy that will be starting um, this summer into fall, for the procurement module, we're going to hold that here at the ODOT central office and open it up to all subrecipients. That is a full day of instruction on procurement, and we'll be sending out information on that well in advance for you. So procurement policies are really the backbone of a good procurement system. These are required of all subrecipients and will be reviewed and approved by ODOT to ensure compliance with FTA regulations. We're going to, over the next couple of months, be reviewing individual procurement policies and providing individual guidance regarding FTA compliance. What we want to make sure of is that you have protest procedures and conflict of interest addressed in your procurement policies. Um, it's going to be a long process to get through all of your policies, but what we hope to do is, is then have you attach an addendums to your policies with anything that's missing that is required by FTA. In addition to FTA and federal regulations, your individual procurement policies should cover all state, local, and agency-specific purchasing policies and procedures. Micro-purchases. This, this is an area where most of your purchases are probably going to happen, this and in, into the small um, purchases as well. Fair and reasonable price determination, purchase orders, invoices, and Davis-Bacon, which is really only for construction um, at the $2,500 and above level. This is something where, that we'll rarely be running into, and, and if there's, this situation does come up, I ask that you would get in touch with your rep to go over what's required there. Um, for micro-purchases under $3,500, the documentation required is fairly simple. Um, the fair and reasonable price documentation. Every contract award must include a determination that the price is fair and reasonable. This is for micro-purchases, for all purchases. The FTA really wants to know that you're, we're spending their dollars wisely. Uh, the extent of the analysis depends on the value and nature of the contract. At the micro level, it's a fairly simple process, but you still must document that you've determined the price is fair and reasonable. We've developed a form of reasonable, fair and reasonable price determination form to help with that. Uh, all the forms, also all the forms that I go over today uh, and the checklist are available in Black Hat and Global Resources. We also will be making the procurement checklist and forms available on the website at some point soon. Um, also for those 5310 subrecipients, you can contact your reps to have those emailed to you. So here's what that fair and reasonable price determination form looks like. Again, this is a fairly simple form. You just put the date of the purchase, description of goods, 
um, the purchase price, and how you determined that it was fair and reasonable. This should be submitted with your payment request to ODOT and also kept on file with your procurement records. Next, moving to the small purchase level, these are purchases between $3,500 and $150,000. As the level of procurement goes up, so do the documentation requirements. Required federal clauses must be included with all POs above $3,500 at the small and large level. Um, you'll also see I'm at some point here, I'm going to be clicking over to show you the actual procurement checklist. And you'll notice that there's a DBE form referenced on that checklist. We're still in the process of finalizing that. I know that I worked with many of you recently um, to go through your purchases, uh, your, your accounting ledgers to look at DBE, potential DBE um, purchases. This form that we're developing is really going to help us all more efficiently meet the FTA reporting requirements for DBE. So Sarah, when you yes, this is Victoria. I want to just ask you to hang on a second. I'm getting reports that people are not seeing slides on their screens. So I wanted oh. to ask um, if that was a, a global issue, or is it just um, a couple of people? Okay, so we are have do have people that are seeing the slides. Do you see that? Oh, good. It should be on small purchases. Okay. Yeah, it looks like the majority of the people can. For those of you who aren't seeing the slides, if you want to, GoToMeeting has two separate windows that will open. One that usually is to the right of the screen that is, has the chat pod and all that in it, and then usually one to the left. Um, and what you can do is go to your bottom toolbar and click on the GoToMeeting yellow flower icon, and hopefully that will bring both of those screens up for you. Okay, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Please go ahead. Sure. So the other thing that I want to point out with this, uh, the small purchase um, procedures, for purchases above 25000 25000 or more, where ODOT is requiring that you contact your rep prior to procurement for all purchases that are 25000 or more for approval. This is just a, a good idea to, you know, our due diligence at when we're making purchases, larger purchases, um, that we're sure that we have all of the I's dotted and the T's crossed and we're compliant with our procurement. So one of the biggest and most important uh, pieces of procurement is the independent cost estimate. Uh, this requirement is consistently among the top three FTA compliance review findings um, and that is typically um, there's either the ICE does not exist, it never happened, or it was not documented. Um, part of the fun with FTA is that even though you know that you've done it, if it doesn't exist on paper, um, in the FTA's eyes, it, it does not exist. So we need to ensure that we're documenting each step of the process along the way. The ICE form, again, we have one available in Black Cat Global Resources, and, and we can make that available upon request for entities that don't have access to Black Cat. Also will be, again, um, all the procurement, the procurement checklist and forms will be made available on our website at some time in the near future. So the independent cost estimate establishes the range of prices that the goods or services you're acquiring should fall into. This cost estimate documentation provides the justification and the evidence that the price is both fair and reasonable. Taking time to do this step, the the, a good thorough cost estimate in advance can save the work and hassle of having to do a complete uh, Cost analysis should quotes or bids fall far outside what has been determined to be a reasonable range. Um, this could happen if you, um, you know, instead of doing a full independent cost estimate, you look online and you see one price and you say, okay, this is the price that that I think it's going to be. Instead of that, really, you should be looking at two or three 
different sources of information for the same or similar goods or services and, and looking at maybe what a price was last year, what a price is this year, uh, maybe a peer has acquired a similar good or service, reaching out to the peer to find out what they paid. Those are all reasonable ways to go about um, c producing an independent cost estimate. The more time you take doing this, um, it, again, it, it doesn't have to be um, a day-long process. Um, but the more time and thought that you put into it, the better your pr procurement is going to be. And then having the documentation of it in your procurement records is required. This, is, this slide shows what the procurement, uh, the ICE form looks like, what will be covered. You're going to put the contract type and estimate of the price, description of the good and service, how you obtained the estimate, um, whether it was a pub published price, past pricing. We recently had a couple of subrecipients who are um, actually in the large competitive procurement situation of a third party uh, provider, which is you know well over $150,000 procurement. Um, and they are using each other's um, um, previous procurements of third-party providers to help get that, establish that range of um, what the cost should be. That's an option as well. Again, this shows a way, this is a form that you can use that we actually think that you should be using um, just to standardize everyone's procurements. Um, and you can put the product cost each, make sure to include delivered, and all those things that come up after you have started to engage in the process that add additional costs should be captured in the ICE. It really consists of comparing total cost of the same or similar products, goods, and services from a variety of vendors. That's really what the ICE does. So, and this is for services. This last one, this is what you would use for goods. And this is what you would use for services where there's different, you know, you're, you're looking at labor rates rather than just a um, tangible item. Price and cost quotations are another part of the process. Documentation of at least three quotes is required at the small purchase level. This documentation must be included with your payment request and records that you maintain with your procurement records. Um, there, the, there may be instances when an item is unique to one vendor, specific to one vendor, or only one vendor exists within a feasible geographic proximity. In this case, um, a sole source procurement may be required. Um, and, and if there is a sole source, we need a sole source justification to be completed prior to proceeding with the purchase. Um, in these instances, we ask that you contact your uh, rep or compliance staff at ODOT Office of Transit to assist you with that sole source justification. We can walk you through that. The uh, most common example of a sole source is when uh, you may have scheduling and dispatching software that you want to upgrade. Uh, obviously, you want to upgrade within the vendor that you have rather than having to replace your entire system just for an upgrade. Um, so we, we can help you out with the justification for that. We just need to make sure that we have that documented when it occurs. Next, we're going to go on to price and cost analysis. Um, this is an area where there's, there can be some confusion. Um, we're not going to be, you're not going to be engaged in many procurements where, where these come up. Really a price analysis is, is somewhat similar to the ICE that you do. Um, and you're going to be looking at the product must be a com commercial product, one for which there's a basis to compare to the commercial marketplace. Um, and this would be suitable um, the price analysis is an evaluation of the offer's price relative to the prices being offered by other vendors. Really, it's typically you taking the quotations and looking at them. These are what the general public would pay for the same or similar items. 
and just really comparing the prices. So it's not necessary that the competing products be exactly identical to the product being offered, but you must be able to compare uh, the product's capabilities and their respective price differences in light of varying capabilities. Again, when we get into this, these are things that we would ask that you contact uh, Office of Transit staff to help you out with. A cost analysis is different. It's required when a price analysis cannot be performed. Cost analysis really um, is very difficult and can be very expensive. Uh, it's used when bids and proposals come in way outside the price range that you've determined by the independent cost estimate. Uh, and performing a thorough independent cost estimate prior to engaging in a procurement can help to avoid the cost being in a cost analysis um, situation. Um, also, a cost analysis situation is used when a product or service being offered is uh, you can't really evaluate it against other commercially available items or similar products or services. Uh, examples of this would include procurement for professional services where no competing price proposals are submitted. So this would happen if you had an RFP and you only had one, uh, one bidder and um, you know, you've gone through everything and seen that everything else in your procurement is, is good. You've advertised long enough and in enough different uh, areas, enough different sources have been advertised. You've reached out to vendors, but you only have one single source. Um, we typically want to avoid this situation as much as possible because it is it's very um, time consuming oftentimes takes an expert to do a really good cost analysis. So we're hoping not to be in this situation very often. But again, please contact your rep if you are um, when you run into any problems with any of these things. The large procurements of 150,000 plus, again, are going to be um, more rare, we're, we're really going to spend more time with micro and small purchases. For large proc procurements, first of all, before you engage in a large procurement, you must contact your ODOT representative to discuss the process. Large procurements require concurrence from ODOT at three points in the process. First, the approval of your bid and proposal package, approval of your award, recommendations, that's the vendor that you want to award the bid to, and approval of your contract documents once that award has been made. The procurement checklist outlines each step in this process, and at this level of procurement, you'll be partnering closely with ODA Office of Transit compliance staff throughout the process to ensure that we have a compliant process. The written record of procurement history is another FTA requirement. The documents included on the procurement checklist make up the bulk written record of your procurement history. You don't need a separate uh, document, but you do need to ensure that you have documented each of the items on the checklist and have those records kept with your procurement files. That's critical to meeting the procurement requirements. In order to prove that it actually happened, as I mentioned earlier, each of these elements needs to be documented. So where is this checklist? All the documents that we've reviewed or are reviewing today are available in Black Cat. Um, a link to the checklist has been provided in the chat box for those folks who are 5311 subrecipients. You're very familiar with Black Cat, um, and it is in the Global Resources section. Uh, for 5310 subrecipients, the procurement checklist and forms can easily be emailed to you upon request. And again, we're going to offer those on the website as well soon. Um, now I'm going to try something tricky, and I'm going to try to switch over to show you the actual checklist. It's tricky for me. 
probably not that tricky. And I'm just going to check in with Victoria. Victoria, can you see the checklist? Sure can. I see it right okay. there on the screen. And while I'm on here, I just wanted to ask anyone who hasn't muted their phone line to please do so. We are definitely hearing some background noise and typing. Um, we'd appreciate you muting your phone line until um, Sarah's finished and we open things up on questions. So um, the the procurement checklist that I mentioned in the in the slides. This is it. When you go to Black Cat and Global Resources and click the procurement checklist, this is what you're going to see. We have tabs for each of the different levels of procurement along the bottom. And first we start with an overview that talks about why it is we need to document this. The, and we um, you know, touch on the FTA regulation 4220.1F is kind of the Bible of procurement. Um, and there's also the FTA came out in October of 2016 with a new and improved best practices procurement manual, which is, I think, 300 pages long. Um, and it's a great resource. In addition, I think the best resource of all is, is probably uh, National RTAP's Procurement Pro. It's procurement in the cloud. Um, after I go through the checklist, I'm hoping to be able to run us through that as well. I'm going to click on that and show you Procurement Pro. You do need to um, sign up and open an account, but it's, it's a very simple process and can save you a lot of headaches. Um, it's all right there for you. So, so let's see. Here's the micro that I mentioned. This is what the micro checklist looks like. You'll enter the subrecipient name what you're procuring, the year, your project number, your cost. Um, and when you submit for your, your payment request, we're going to want you to submit, along with your PO and invoice, your fair and reasonable price documentation form, which I showed you earlier. That's in the same folder on Black Cat with the procurement checklist. Again, I mentioned the DBE form. We will be rolling that out shortly. It's in the final stages of um, revision. So that's going to help us really to, to quantify our DBE participation uh, and how we collect that data, which we do twice a year. The small, again, here's what the checklist looks like. As we get larger purchases, there's a higher level of detail required in documentation. The same thing up here, you, your name, the item or service being procured, year, project, total cost number. Um, again, please remember that for purchases greater than $25,000, you must receive ODOT concurrence uh, prior to engaging in the procurement. Also, I'd like to note, subrecipients are responsible for following the ODOT approved procurement policies of, their, of your governing entity and all applicable state and local regulations. These checklists that we're going over really are specific to FTA compliance. It's on you to ensure that your policies are cover all the local state regulations and your local agencies purchasing policies. We're, we're not policing that. Um, another thing I'd like to point out here is the vendor responsibility piece right here. This is in the SAMS. You, you're going to go online. What's going to happen in most instances is you're going to enter the vendor name in the systems of award. SAM stands for systems of award management. And um, you entered the vendor's name. M more likely than not, it's going to pop up and say no results were found. There are no results. It, it, it seems a little funny, but we need you to print that out and include it with your information. This proves that I'm hearing something funny. Yeah, we need everyone to make sure their phone line's muted. Um, we're getting feedback because phone lines aren't muted. So please double check and make sure you've got your phone line muted. Thank you. OK. Um, 
again, uh, it's, it seems a little counterintuitive if no search results come up that you would need to um, document that, but that is indeed the case. It's what we want to see, that there are no search results. Um, included in your documentation, of course, your awarded supplier's proposal. Um, the written record of procurement history, I've already mentioned, all of these items make that up. Um, invoice, DBO, um, again, I want to I note the required federal clauses, in addition to the independent cost estimate, lack of required federal clauses is among the top three findings in FTA compliance, procurement compliance reviews. So we're really um, looking to you to ensure that you have attached the federal clauses. When I show you Procurement Pro in a minute, I'll, you will see that those clauses will attach, um, will attach automatically when you've entered your procurement information in Procurement Pro. It makes it very easy. Also, if you have any questions, always ask someone from ODOT and we can help you out with that. When we get to the large uh, competitive over $150,000 purchases, things get a little bit uh, more complicated. Uh, the top part is always the same where you're going to enter what you're procuring, your procurement project number. Um, when you get to this stage, we're going to be heavily involved in the process with you, and you are going to require concurrence by ODOT at three steps. First, the approval of your bid proposal package. Uh, that's going to include your uh, notice of, of RFP, your advertising, um, along with your the actual proposal package. Um, once you've gone through that and you have um, determined, you've gone through, solicited, you've opened your proposals, and you've determined who you'd like to award the, the um, RFP to or IFP, um, we're going to have to do an approval of that award recommendation. So what we'll do is review, um, review how you determined that that vendor was the most responsive to your, to your um, RFP or IFP. Again, our third level of concurrence is approval of the contract document. Once you've got concurrence to award um, the vendor, you'll then go into develop a contract. Uh, your legal team will need to make sh to approve of your contract, and then ODOT will concur on that. So, as you see, again, I'm not going to go through each of these. Compliance is a very um, complicated process, it's the most complicated uh, process in terms of FTA compliance, and um, I'm hoping that many of you can attend the procurement module during Transit Academy, that's a full day, and, and really procurement does require at least a full day um, to understand all the different parts, so, so I'm really focusing on what ODOT is requiring. per purchase. So, sole source. Um, this is for any, uh, sole source justification is required for sole source above the $3,500 level. So if you're, you know, if you have a, maybe an internet uh, provider contract that you have with one provider, it's less than $3,500, you do not need a sole source justification for that, you do still need to determine that the price is fair and reasonable, um, but it, the, in instances where sole source justification is required, those are for purchases of 3500 or more. Um, and again, if a sole source justification is required, um, we ask that you get in touch with us here at ODOT and we can help you out with that. Procurement history, again, all of the things that we've gone over, those would be included. Um, if you're at the larger level, you're going to include um, the date that the, uh, that the RFP is advertised, all of the documents to support the procurement that you're engaged in. Okay.
bear with me as I bring the screen back up. Additional procurement resources. Um, again, I mentioned 4220.1F. This is the FTA Circular Third Party Contracting Guidelines. This is the Bible of procurement. Um, please do review it. Uh, if you have questions that you're asking us, we're probably going to be reviewing it. It's the go-to for any regulation regarding procurement. Again, I mentioned the best practices procurement and lessons learned manual. This was updated in October of 2016. It's very thorough um, and it goes over the best practices. It's not regulatory. The, the 4221.F is really the regulation. Uh, the best practices procurement and lessons learned manual is more of the how-to and the best ways to go about um, following the circular. Sorry to interrupt and again. We are definitely hearing somebody just typing away, and now we're hearing background noise. If you could please just double check your phone line, make sure it's muted. We'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Okay, now I'm going to try to actually take us into the National RTAP Pro Procurement Pro site. Um, again, bear with me. Hopefully I can just easily do this. Okay. I'm going to ask Victoria, can you see that? Am I sure, can the you RC? See that? Getting ready to click oh. into the cloud login. Okay. Okay, welcome. Um, in addition to Procurement Pro, um, for those of you who have not been to the National RTAP site, um, it's, a, it's a treasure trove of tools and um, very, very helpful. I, rec I highly recommend it. There are webinars you can use with your staff that will cover some of your um, training requirements. Um, but, but for now, I'm just going to stick with the um, Procurement piece. So Procurement Pro is this right here. Again, again, what I did to to log in, it was it was very simple. Um, once you've created a username and password, uh, you're you're all good to go. Um, hopefully, I can log in here. Yeah, so you're you're going to go ahead and once you're in Procurement Pro, you're going to um, create a new project. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, they're temporarily down for maintenance. Um, <laughs> great, that's perfect. Um, so I did show you how to get here. Once you get into this part, um, even though it's down for, for maintenance, I'm glad that we were able to get at least to this part. It does show you here's where you would go. Um, and then it's fairly simple. It you walks you through the process. You enter your information, your the good or service that you're procuring, um, and it's just a step-by-step, easy-to-use procurement tool. Also, any updates that happen, like when we went to the super circular, those will be noted as well. And this generates your federal clauses, which I spoke of earlier it generates them automatically and attaches them to your procurement documents. So, so that's that. I'm sorry that we can't look at more of it, but um, I'm hopeful that the maintenance will happen quickly and we, you'll be able to go in and take a peek at it. Let's see. Okay, and that I guess that's a very quick and dirty look at the procurement uh, process for for ODOT and the and the procurement checklist. Now we're going to open it up for questions. Again, I also would ask that you um, type your questions into the chat box as well as as asking them, or in addition to asking them, so that we do have a record of the questions and answers. A lot of times, those 
Q and A's can be um, very helpful, and your questions um, might be similar to the questions that your peers have as well. So it serves as an, an additional resource for us all. So I am open for questions. Everybody has been unmuted from our end. If your phone line is still muted, it's because you have it muted on your side. Um, we do have and one question about, is this for capital purchases only? At this point, the, the checklist has been used um, fairly specifically for um, for the payment reimbursement process. So yes, for capital items. Although that doesn't negate the need to follow procurement guidelines with any purchases that you're making. Any purchases that you're making with FTA dollars, you need to be following a procurement process. The documentation forms that we've gone over on the checklist have been used by ODOT specifically in the payment reimbursement process in order to be reimbursed for a for a project, a capital item. Does yeah, that answer the question? question? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Howard, why don't you type back in and let us know if that answered your question. Um, we had a question concerning the PowerPoint, and it's going to be emailed out to everyone after the webinar is complete. There's a question from Tina Bradley. Does every micro purchase need to have a form completed and submitted with our invoice? For example, if a $10 item is purchased, is the form only related to contracts? It's really only related to, um, for, in this instance, it's related to the projects that you're going to be um, making payment requests for outside of your invoices. Um, we're not going to, that is a good question, and we've discussed that in-house, whether to have one for, for your invoices, for, the, for, the, for your um, regular, everyday, year-round purchases, to have one micro uh, reasonable price, reasonable fair price determination form for an entire year. So maybe incorporating that in the application process. Um, so that we have that covered as well as covering your project-based uh, procurements, capital item procurements. Thanks. So wait, the I guess the answer right now is no, we don't need that for your invoices at this point, but we're going to be incorporating something probably a once a year with your application. There was a comment from David. Um, this process also involves procurement of transit service contracts and maintenance service contracts. That was a comment from David Seach. And then okay. Howard did respond that, yes, his question had been answered. OK, great. That's awesome. All right, there's another mm -hmm. question. Is this needed for purchasing vehicle off-state term contracts? No, it's not because that procurement is handled at the state level. So we're doing that on our side. We're, we go through the exact same process as the subrecipients do for their procurements um, and document all of those things. I just recently did. Um, I recently did the ICE for the new state term contract for vehicles. So, so that's been that's been done for the subrecipients um, who are purchasing off the state term contract. Great. Any other questions? The phone lines are open. You can feel free to type into the chat pod. There's a question that came in from Chris. It says, we are in Cleveland and our 5310 purse strings holder is NOACA. Do we work directly with them in regards to the purchasing policy? Hmm. That's a good question. Is there is it possible for that to be typed in the chat box also so that I can? Oh, yeah, um, it is. It's there. Oh, OK. So I'm going to have to look into that and get back. I'm not exactly, I'm not exactly sure. They, is, is the subrecipient working with that, with that other entity? Then they would use that entity's procurement policy. I think that's what the question is around. Correct. All right, okay. then we had another question that came in from VWCCOA says, what about the capitalized maintenance? Again, those are, um, we haven't in the past been documenting, um, asking for procurement documentation for things that are invoiced. Um, I do see that happening in the future, but that's a discussion we're having in-house and to, to determine how we're going to, to roll that out. 
Great. And then there was a response from Dave Seach to the earlier question regarding, regarding NOACA. Dave Seach says that you work directly with NOACA because they are the designated recipient for 5310. Okay, good. That's helpful because I don't know what NOACA is. So thank you, Dave Seach. Uh, any other questions from our audience? If not, I just want to thank everyone for um, taking time to participate today. I know it's a little bit um, bumpy and choppy. Um, you can always come back to the and, and join us again for the February 16th version, um, which will be a little bit improved over this, I hope. Um, but also, please know that we're you know we have folks on staff here to help you out if you have any questions you can always reach out and um, you know we all are together we're all together in this and we all want to be compliant so we, we can help you out in any any way you need let us know please yep. and if you come up with questions after we end the webinar feel free to email those in and we'll make sure that they get to Sarah and crew for answers for you all right I don't see anything else coming in so thank you everyone we're going to go ahead and, and end the webinar now we appreciate your attendance thank you thanks Thank you.